Station. This is Dean Emily Allen of Cal State Los Angeles. How do you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. Hello, my name is Maria Munguia. I am a sophomore at Cal State LA in mechanical engineering. Uh, my question is from Mike. Um, becoming an astronaut is one of the greatest endeavors of our lifetime, as well of, as one of the most challenging. Um, how did you overcome your greatest obstacle on the road to becoming an astronaut? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest obstacles is, is being patient. It, and it can take a lot of time to gain the right education, the right experience to, to even have a chance to become an astronaut. I know for myself, I applied uh, four times before I was selected over the course of 12 years. I think Rick was probably uh, very, you know, over nine years, uh, same kind of scenario. So it can take a long time, and uh, so you just have to be patient. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Alberto Lamia, and I'm a 12th grader at Stern Mass High School. Um, Rick, what first sparked your interest in exploring outer space, and how did it influence your academic career? I was always interested in uh, space and science. When I was, even when I was back, I can remember as far back as fifth or sixth grade, I remember being very interested when the teacher would talk about anything related to science, especially space-related or, or airplanes, anything related to airplanes or flying. So all that stuff has just always interested me. And uh, obviously, uh, when I got into high school, I would talk to my guidance counselors, and they, they heard what my interests were, and they told me to go into engineering. So that affected, obviously, what the choice of career I chose, just by, based on my interest. And then when I was an engineer at the University of Connecticut and got out of there and graduated from there, I went and got a master's degree, got a job as an engineer, and eventually applied as an astronaut. So I think my interest in space and science and my abilities in mathematics had a direct uh, uh, relationship on how I ended up here. My name is Arnold Alvarez. I'm a junior at Castellé in mechanical engineering. Um, Kuichi, the International Space Station plays a huge role in investigating many trends on Earth. How do you think the future of our planet looks for us living under the current conditions? Yeah, that's a really uh, good question and a tough question. Uh, the Earth has experienced a series of uh, very uh, drastic climate changes in history, and uh, that's why it's very important to uh, to understand and uh, to keep monitoring precisely what's happening on the Earth. And uh, ISS is playing a key role in there, and we have wonderful equipment to, to observe that, uh, namely the uh, what's happening on land, the ocean, and also in the atmosphere. And uh, we have to work in conjunction with the uh, other space assets like uh, satellites. So uh, by monitoring precisely what's happening, we will be able to predict uh, the future trend. Thank you. My name is Audrey Perez. I am a 10th grader at LA County High School for the Arts. Mike, what view from space made the biggest impression on you and why? Well, that's a, that's a tough question as well because uh, there's a, a lot of just amazing views uh, from space. Uh, looking out the cupola window down at, uh, down at the Earth is, is truly amazing. But I have to say probably the biggest impression for me was uh, going out the hatch the first time for my EVA. And when you finally get to see the Earth uh, in all its glory without any obstructions around you, just, uh, just through your, your visor, uh, that, that leaves a pretty big impression. Thank you. Hello, my name is Virginia Mejia. I am a senior in Cal State LA majoring in industrial technology. Rick, as an astronaut, you undergo difficult training and simulations meant to represent space conditions. 
Can you describe the training to us, and do you feel it has truly prepared you for the, for the extreme conditions of space? Yeah, that's true. We do a lot of training as an astronaut, years and years and years and years of training. Just for this mission alone, we trained, I trained two and a half, three years. Uh, so the different types of training we have, it's a lot of classroom training. Uh, we were just learning about different things, about space station systems, about vehicle systems, and about payloads. And then we also have simulators, like you said. We have, uh, we have the Soyuz simulator that we train for. Of course, I used to train in the space shuttle simulator. We have space station simulators. Some of them are different fidelity. Some of them are high fidelity. Some of them are low fidelity. We have the uh, payload simulators, where uh, sometimes it's actual hardware. And then, of course, we have uh, the NBL, the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, which is a, just basically a large, large swimming pool where we practice our spacewalks and we, we, they make us neutrally buoyant so we don't float and we don't sink and it's like we're it kind of simulates that we're in space and that's how we practice our spacewalks but this training is all very very um uh, not, it's not very continuous. It's like, a, it's like pieces of a puzzle, and all these pieces are all jumbled up, and you don't really get to put them all together until you actually do the mission. But the training works very, very well. We train very, very hard for a very long time, but it all comes together on the mission, and that's why, things, that's why NASA is so successful, because we train so hard. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marcos Gonzalez. I'm a 10th grader at College Ready Academy High School number five. Uh, Guichi, do you have laws you have to follow on the space station? And if so, who is the governing body? And what are the repercussions of breaking laws? I think Rick thinks that he governs the uh, space station, but the, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, treaties and agreements among the uh, partner nations of the International Space Station, and uh, that defines or uh, that governs uh, how the uh, space station operation will be conducted. And also, uh, we have a crew code of conduct uh, that applies to all astronauts to follow. And, uh, but as far as the law, uh, to an individual astronaut uh, flying in space, uh, the country the, uh, from, from which uh, the astronaut is from, its domestic uh, uh, law will apply to the individual astronaut. Hello, my name is Raymond Olivares. I'm a freshman here at Cal State Lake studying civil engineering. Mike, what advice would you give someone passionate about the wonders of space, who wants to become an astronaut, but doesn't feel like he's gonna make it? Yeah, you know, this kind of goes along with uh, the first question that I was asked, and um, and that's one, you need to be patient, but I, I think just as important is you need to find something that you love, and uh, no matter what, then, if, if you don't get selected as an astronaut, at least you're doing something that you're very passionate about, that you want to be doing, and that you're excited about every morning when you get up and go to work, and that's probably the best advice I could give you. My name is Esmeralda Navarro. I'm an 11th grader at Stern Mass High School. Rick, if you could choose between living in space or on Earth, what would you choose, and do you think one day people will be living in space? Well, I think I choose to live on the Earth, but uh, I would love, I enjoy visiting space. It's a great place to visit, and it's a great place to live for uh, periods of time. Uh, but, of course, you know, my family and my friends and uh, lots of other things that I enjoy are back down on Earth. And just, you know, enjoying the weather, enjoying the grass, enjoying nature is, is something you really miss when you're up here. So I would choose to live on the Earth but uh, visit space as much as I can. Uh, I think, yes, someday we will live in space. We've been living in space since uh, 2000, and 2000, basically. Uh, the first folks moved up here to the space station has been permanently manned since then. Now, will folks move up into space and, and spend their whole lives from birth to death? Well, maybe someday, but that's probably far in the future. Thank you. My name is Sarah Robeson. I'm a sophomore at Cal State LA in mechanical engineering. Koichi, what is the most difficult experiment you have conducted in space, and how is it unique to the environment? 
Well, that's a tough question. Uh, actually, uh, we conduct a lot of experiments. Uh, some of the experiments require very complicated preparation. But uh, we have really good procedures. And also, when we conduct experiments, we have real-time support from the ground support team. So uh, we usually can uh, perform those experiments without any problem. But uh, some of the experiments uh, require high level of, I don't know, may, uh, maybe attention by the crew members. For example, uh, Marangoni experiment uh, that uh, has been, conduct been conducting here uh, with a remote control from the ground uh, uh, scientists. Uh, that's done usually at night. And that experiment uh, is uh, to study the, uh, the convection of Marangoni, which is caused by a gradient of a surface tension of a fluid. And we have to be very quiet for this experiment to be conducted. So we have to be very careful when we close open the toilet door and then uh, you know, opening closing the crew quarters door and something like that. So some of the experiment really needs attention, uh, such as to be very quiet. And those are the kind of tough questions, uh, tough experiments. Thank you. My name is Melissa Latrice, and I'm a junior at Cal State in mechanical engineering. Mike, how does your knowledge of everyday life on Earth affect the way you interpret scientifically what you encounter in outer space? Yeah, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, it certainly impacts everything that, that we do up here. And, you know, we've got, uh, there's, there's things down on Earth, uh, problems down on Earth, such as, uh, for example, uh, bacteria that are becoming resistant to antibiotics. And we just did an experiment up here uh, that uh, we were looking at that very same problem. That helps us uh, on station in space exploration. But it's also something that's that's very valuable for, for people down on Earth. So it's certainly, uh, you, you apply all of that knowledge to, to the experiment that you're, you're doing up here, and it, it kind of opens your eyes to the benefits of them. My name is Johnny Cortez. I'm a 10th grader at College Ready Academy High School number five. Rick, what is your daily hygienic routine in space, and how hard is it to shave? That's a personal question. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, you know, I, I like to say that uh, space is the place where the impossible is easy, and the things that are used to be easy are now difficult. So things like uh, simply brushing your teeth and washing your face and shaving are much more difficult. You know, we don't have uh, running water up here, so basically we just fill up small bags of water. I squirt some water on my face, a little bit of shaving cream, and I shave. But there's no way to rinse the blade, so basically I have to use up a whole blade every day. Uh, and luckily NASA provides me a new blade every day. So it's not much different, but uh, it is quite a, a little bit different. My name is Luis Carmona. I'm a senior at Cal State LA, uh, civil engineering. Uh, Koichi, how do you and your family feel about being in space for long periods? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, as Rick said, space is a wonderful place to live and work. Uh, but I do really uh, miss uh, my family and uh, long duration of space flight and also long training. And we have training in not only in the States, Japan, Russia, Europe, and Canada. So uh, this experience puts some additional stress to the family. But we have really wonderful uh, family support team on the ground and the communication tools that we have, uh, telephones, emails, and also we have a video conference with our family, uh, usually on a weekend. These communication tools are very huge uh, psychological support for all of us. Thank you. Hi my, oh, hi, my name is Kaylin Peralta, and I am a 10th grader at College Ready Academy High School number 5. Mike, can you describe a time and space or during your training when you've had a close call? Um, you know, that's a, that's a good question, and I, I, would, um, I guess I'm going to answer that by saying, you know, Rick talked about all the training we do, and a lot of that training is focused around safety. And so um, what happens with that, uh, when you train so much, you're, you're focused on, 
on keeping things safe that that a lot of times you may have a close call but you may not feel like it's a close call because your training kicks in and you react to the situation and uh, and and get get through the problem whatever it may be so I've I've been very fortunate uh, that you know from a close call perspective I don't recall really having any that are, are that bad of course you know we've had some problems outside the station and you know for example uh, in December we had a a problem with the ammonia cooling system and so we had to go out and repair it but again the training kicked in and, and you've got this wonderful support team on on the ground that uh, helps you out and everything went very smooth and safely hi my name is phoebe Stilson, and i am a senior at cal state la in mechanical engineering my question is for rick what one piece of technology would you most like to see improved on the space station in order to make your living conditions more comfortable? Yeah, we like saying a pizza oven might be a great one, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we have a lot of good food up here, obviously, but in uh, the variety I thought was pretty good, but now I've been up here for three months and it's, it seems to start to get a little bit repetitive. So obviously a more uh, a wider variety of food would also, would definitely make life better. But I think uh, there's no one piece of technology. I think it's just a question of, of integrating everything and thinking about how the uh, how we live up here a little bit more. You know, when we build these space stations, we we uh, have to solve a lot of problems to build, build these things, and they cost a lot of money. And sometimes the uh, creature comforts don't get uh, taken care of uh, completely. Like, I, but I, let me say that we do live very comfortably up here. But there's always room for improvement. Uh, but. Uh, I can't think of any one thing other than maybe a little better food and a little better uh, hygienic preparation area. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jeremy Belair. I'm a senior at Cal State LA in electrical engineering. And my question is for Kochi. How does the space station deal with vibration and temperature change? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, as for the uh, vibration, uh, some of the experiments, uh, for example, like a fluid dynamics and also like a material processing type experiments that requires high level of microgravity. So uh, we're in the U.S. laboratory now, but uh, we have uh, payload racks that have uh, um, active or passive uh, vibration isolation system to uh, to minimize the vibration and also we do exercise a lot the running machine uh, uh, resistive exercise device those exercise devices also have vibration isolation system to minimize or to mitigate those vibration that is unfavorable for experiments and uh, as far as the thermal conditioning uh, we have uh, active and thermal conditioning uh, uh, thermal control system throughout the space station and that uh, gives us the uh, comfortable temperature and the comfortable temperature for the uh, for the computers and other equipment uh, throughout the space station. Thank you. My name is Ben Galetta. I am a sophomore at Cal State LA and majoring in computer science. And my question is for Mike. Mike, is there any downtime aboard the station? And if so, how do you use this time? Yeah, fortunately, there there is uh, some downtime. We have pretty long days during the week. We actually uh, probably work about 12 hours during the day, and then once things are done around 7:30, 8 o'clock at night, uh, you know, it's time to catch up on emails and and make some phone calls to the family and friends. Uh, but we also take a lot of pictures. The cupola is, is actually fantastic views of the Earth, and so you want to try and capture that and share as much of that as you can. And then uh, you know the other great thing about up here is we're floating, and so it never gets old, and it's always fun to try new things. Hi, my name is Alex Cabrera, and I'm a senior at Cal State LA. Um, my question is for Rick. Now that you've reached space and seen firsthand what billions of people will never experience, what is your next step?
Yeah, that's a good question. This is my fourth mission, so I, I've got to uh, experience this many, many times. Uh, I think my next step is uh, I'm going to get, I want to get involved in some of the new vehicles. NASA is designing a new vehicle called Orion, and we also have several commercial companies designing vehicles. I'd like to get involved with some of these new vehicles to help design them and use my experience to, to help make those vehicles maybe just a little bit better. All right, and that was our last question for today. So we just want to say thank you. So if everyone in the audience will tell the astronauts a big thank you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you.